Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. This is what it says. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. When he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself, then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, open scripture to us. Open worship to us. Create space enough where we might not just know about you, but we might experience your presence here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A little while back, I was in a retail store. It was a slow business day, and I struck up a conversation with the fellow who was working there. He was a young guy. He was college age, and he was working at this store while he was in college to earn some spending money. And the whole time we were talking, I noticed that he, his eyes kept darting to the television that was behind me. There was a motorcycle race that was going on, and well, it was a good bit more interesting than I am, and I understood that. But I thought I might hazard a guess, and so I asked him, I said, do you ride a motorcycle? Well, then he perked up, and he said, yeah. I said, what kind of street bike do you have? Well, he began to talk about the street bike that he had, and, and we began to swap stories back and forth about motorcycles and riding motorcycles, and, and oh, I, I had really touched a nerve, something that he really liked a lot, and we started chatting about motorcycles, and then I tried my best to hold it in, but I couldn't help it. It just plopped out there. I, I tried my best to hold it back, but the the dad in me came out. And that's when I said it. I said, oh, do be careful. <laughs> I, I said, oh, the worst bang up I ever had was getting off a motorcycle when I should have stayed on it. I said, I, I had a bruise the size of a volleyball. And I said, it, it, and it was the color of an eggplant. I said, there wasn't one bit of Caucasian in the whole thing. And he said, oh, I know what kind of bruise you're talking about. I was attacked by an elephant one time. <laughs> you know, when somebody tells you they're attacked by an elephant, there's not a good, oh yeah, and you know, I know what that's like. I, I was chased by a dog. You know, there, there's just, there's no, it, the only thing left to say is, 
wow, tell me more. He said, well, I, he said, I was on a, a, a foreign study program. We were in Malaysia and um, we were in the market. He said, I gave my cell phone to my friend and said, I'm going to go stand next to that elephant and take a picture of me. He said, I went over and stood next to the elephant, but the elephant didn't want his picture taken. He said, he picked me up, he slammed me on the ground, and he began to gore me with his tusks. I said, well, I hope you got a picture of it. He said, no. He said, my friend was just so dumbfounded that this was happening. He said, the thing that made it worse is the owner of the elephant came and started yelling at me for upsetting his elephant. <laughs> well, there's some stories that are just so big that it, we, we kind of can't relate. We, it's tough to relate to them. The, where do we fit? There's no place to fit into a story like that other than, wow, this is one of those stories. It's hard to say, yeah, I remember the time that I was crucified, dead, and buried. No, there's, the, 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 we, we come to hear this story that the response is, wow, tell me more. And there's plenty to tell. The story starts off that early in the morning on the first day of the week. Now, that's not a throwaway line. That doesn't just happen to tell when it was. The first day of the week, that the Gospel of John is first and foremost a creation story. John starts his Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the same way that, that Genesis starts. The first creation story started in a garden. The new creation. The new creation. John's letting us know this is the new creation that's starting, and it's starting on the first day of the week, the same as that old creation, that it's starting in the garden. And while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to see not the risen Christ. She went to see a corpse that when the Romans killed people, they stayed dead. The Romans majored in death. They were better at it than anybody. This wasn't their first crucifixion. They had crucified thousands and thousands of people. They knew how it was to be done. And at the end, there was no hope for, oh, well, you know, in three days they'll come back. No. Jesus was dead, and Mary Magdalene went to go see his corpse, to anoint his corpse, to prepare it for the burial. But when she got there, the stone was rolled away, so she ran to tell the disciples. She told John and Peter, and they ran to the tomb. It says that, that John was a little younger, so he, he got there first. He outran Peter, and he stopped at the, at the opening of the grave, and Peter ran straight past him into the tomb, and that's when John entered in, and they, they saw the linen wrappings lying there, and it says they saw and believed. Now, that's a head scratcher right there, because you have to wonder, well, what is it that they believed? Because the very next verse says that they went home. And the next story is they went home and shut the doors for fear. What did they see and believe? Because they still went home, they shut the door for fear. For fear. It was Mary Magdalene who stayed. She stayed and she wept. And that's when two angels appeared. She didn't recognize them as angels. One of them said, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken his body and I don't know where they've laid him. And then Jesus spoke to her. Well, she didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And he said, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? Not just what's going on with you, but who, who is it that you're looking for? And Mary Magdalene, thought he was the gardener, and said, if you know where they've taken his body, tell me, and I will take, I will take him. That's when Jesus said her name, Mary. 
And that's when her eyes were opened. And she saw that it was Jesus and she began to hug him. And that's when new life, that's where our stories intersect with his story. That's where we become a part of that, that story that's, that's too big, that, that story that's so great. That's where, it, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where contact is made. When he says, your name and mine, and he does. Each day, he, he knows your name and he calls us by name. And she began to hug him and he said, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Go tell the disciples. Mary went to tell the disciples, the ones that I had mentioned. They were, they were at home, shut behind closed doors for fear. And Jesus appears, it says, behind those shut, closed doors. And his first words to them while they were huddled in fear, were peace be with you. Then he offers the word of peace. That's where his story becomes our story. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we con make contact with this, this story that's almost too big to, to, that, that we can take part in it. But that's where we make the contact. That's where Jesus reaches us in his word of peace, peace be with you. And then he showed them the nail scar in his hands. He showed them where the centurion had, had stabbed him with the, with the spear in his side. And that's when Scripture tells us that he opened his mouth and breathed on them. The first creation started on the first day of the week. The first creation began in the garden. The first creation began when the breath of God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. And now in this new creation, Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit is, is coming, breathing out of Jesus. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is breathing into disciples, and that's the power that breathes in you and me today. That's where the, the rubber meets the road, where the contact is made, where his story becomes our story, and new life, new life is breathed into this old life. New creation is breathed into this old creation. And Jesus breathed on his disciples then as he breathes on his disciples now and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The story doesn't stop there. Luke chapter 24 tells us that, that, uh, that later on that day, two of the disciples who obviously weren't here in the room were walking on the road to Emmaus. They were talking about what had gone on that they had heard that Mary had, had seen the empty tomb. They'd heard that the disciples were talking about what had gone on, but this was Cleopas and another disciple, and suddenly there's a stranger that's walking with them. They don't recognize that this stranger is Jesus, risen from the grave. And the stranger asks, what are you talking about? And they say, are you the only one in all of Jerusalem who hasn't heard? Jesus, Nazareth, the one that we thought would redeem Israel, he was crucified. He died. They buried him. And, and today is the third day. And they're talking about it. They're talking about his tomb is empty and that he, he was risen from the grave. And, and they begin to walk with with the risen Christ, not recognize him as the risen Christ, all the way to Emmaus. And that night, it's Jesus who breaks bread and gives praise to God. He gives thanks and praise to God. And that's when their eyes were open and they recognize that it's Jesus, that it's not just a story that someone else told, that it's Jesus alive and there with them. In the same way that Jesus is alive now with us this day. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the contact is made. That's where his story becomes our story. That's where 
the new creation is breathed into the old creation and new life begins. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That new life, new life, it begins in praise and thanks. Praise and thanks to God. I read a story about a woman that was pastor of a, a little church. Oh, the people loved her dearly. That was all but two crotchety old farmers. And they just couldn't say anything good to her or about her, or really about anything else. And one of the members of the church said, you know, these two old guys, they go fishing every Friday morning early. And I'll bet you if you went fishing with them, they'd come to know you and they would love you the same way that the rest of us do. Well, she thought she'd give it a try. So she saw the, the two old farmers after church one day and she said, you know, I understand you fellas go, go fishing on Friday morning. If you'll have me, I'd love to go fishing with you sometime. They looked at each other and they said, we leave from the diner at 530 on Friday morning. If you're late, we'll be gone. Well, she got there early on Friday morning. They went to the lake together, got out into the boat, and they started fishing, and she caught the first fish. Well, they didn't like that at all. And if they liked, didn't like that much, they liked it even less. She caught the next five fish. And then she said, you know, I'm a little chilly. I left my sweater in the car. She stepped out of the boat, walked on the water, and walked all the way to the parking lot. One farmer turned to the other one and said, wouldn't you know, she can't even swim. <laughs> That's a light treatment of a very important subject. The miracles happen every day. And in the complaining, in the griping, we'll never see them. That it's in the praise that it's in the thanks that our eyes are open. It's in the praise and the, and the thanks. Not to thanks to goodness or thanks to good luck or thanks to good fortune. It's in the thanks to God and the praise to God. Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray and he said, pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is a word we don't use often today, but it's, a, it's how holy. It's to lift his name up and, and pray. It's to lift his name up in thanks. And it's that praise, it's that thanks that changes our eyes. That we might see his presence in the here and now. That our eyes might be opened and our hearts might burn within us. That it's in the praise, it's in the thanks to God that our, our eyes are open to the new creation, to the new life that's offered to you and me now. It's how our story intersects with, with his story. But it's not only in the praise and thanks that it's in faith. It's in faith that we begin to to experience the, the new creation, the new life that Jesus ushered into the here and now, this day, into our lives. I read a story about chief of police of a large city who was given the devotion at a prayer breakfast one morning. And he told this story about a, an officer who was making a routine traffic stop, pulling over a car, but he didn't know that the driver of the car had just robbed a grocery store. The driver jumped out of the car when the officer was approaching the car and he shot the officer squarely in the chest, knocking him to the ground. What the, what the robber, what the driver didn't know is that the officer was wearing a bulletproof vest. So he was shocked to see that the officer stood back up after being knocked to the ground. And that's when the, the driver thought he'd shot Robocop, so he threw his gun to the ground and raised his hands up and said, don't shoot, don't shoot, I'm not armed, I'm not armed. And the chief of police contrasts that story to another story, a story that happened in a nearby city. 
It said that an officer was going to a domestic call, that he didn't expect any problems, that it was a hot day and he had left his bulletproof vest in the trunk of the car. When he went to knock on the door, the person behind the door didn't know who it was and shot through the door, and shot and killed the officer. That's when the chief of police in his devotion went on to say, every police officer believes in bulletproof vests. They work. I doubt you could find a policeman anywhere who doesn't believe those vests save lives. But that's not enough. An officer must do more than believe in vests. He must take his belief to the point of personal commitment. He must be willing to wear the vest and to wear it at all times, even when it's hot, even when it's uncomfortable. And in a similar way, it's not enough to believe that a man named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. We must take that belief to a point of commitment. We must be willing to take that belief to the point of putting on the risen Christ to receive him as Savior and Lord. To receive him as Savior and Lord. To put on Christ. That's, that, it's called faith, to trust, to rely on. To make a, a commitment that... What he did on the cross is enough. Enough. Enough to take away the power of the old creation. That old creation of guilt, of fear, of shame, of sin. That old creation that would, would crush us, that would destroy us. He took all of those things that would crush us and destroy us and defeat us. And he took it on himself on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf, that we might be made right with God, that he took all those things from the old creation that would destroy us and crush us, and he nailed it to the cross to take its, away its power once and for all. And to have faith is to lean on, to rely on, to trust, to put on Christ that what he did on, cross, on the cross was enough to save us from that old creation. And he rose again as Lord to lead us. And it's not enough just to, to believe that he did it 2,000 years ago. It's the rubber meets the road. He makes contact with us here this day that we, we put on the risen Christ is the way that Scripture often talks about it in Romans 12, 13. It's the way that, that, that the Bible talks about it in Ephesians, to, to put on Christ as the, the armor of God, that He surrounds us and protects us in a way that we can't protect ourselves. It's the way that the, the Bible talks about it, that we breathe in His Spirit, the way that talks about here in the resurrection story as his breath of life becomes our breath of life and a new life and a new creation that he not only surrounds us that he's inside of us and well the bible even talks about it that he walks beside us in the book of galatians and whether it's around us or inside us or beside us it's that he has strength you and I don't have. And so we trust, we have faith in that strength to lead us as his Lord. To lead us as, and to, to have faith, to lean on and to rely on him. It's a new life that he offers it's how the rubber meets the road, how we make contact with the old story. It's how the, the new life, his life, becomes a part of our life in faith, in praise, in thanks. And the last thing that I want to talk about, that, the, that his life becomes a part of our life in faith, praise, and thanks, and and in healing love, in healing love. You know, 
in life, there's some things that we pursue and there's some things that ensue. There's some things that we, we go after and there's some things that follow. We pursue and, and some things ensue. And one of the things that is very true is that if we pursue healing love, that Jesus doesn't follow. That we pursue Jesus. That Jesus is, is first, foremost, or the way the Bible puts it, Jesus is preeminent. That there's no close second or third. And that it's healing love that follows. It's healing love that ensues. We pursue Jesus and it's a healing love that ensues in a new life. I read a story about a fellow who moved to Alaska. He had been there about five or six months and he ran into a Catholic priest. He turned to him and he said, Father, I'm glad that I ran into you. He said, I've only lived in Alaska about five or six months and, and I don't believe in prayer anymore. The priest said, well, tell me more. He said, well, it was about four or five months ago that I was with some friends and we were out hunting. He said, I got separated from the friends and it got dark and then it got cold. And I began to, to pray that, that God would save me and then it began to snow and I began to pray even more that God would rescue me from the, the dark and, and the cold and the snow but God didn't rescue me, so I don't believe in prayer anymore. And the priest said, I'm confused. You're standing here talking to me now. And that's when the man said, whoa, well, God didn't rescue me. That was the locals. Well, I have good news this morning. God still uses locals. And that's you and that's me. He uses locals for healing love in a world that desperately needs to know what it is to be whole, what it is to be loved. Loved not in a way that humans can love. Love in a way that only Jesus can love with a forgiving love, with a, a love that bears one another's burdens, not just when people are lovable or not just when they're kin, not just when they're a blood relative, not just when they're lovely, but a power and a love that heals and loves even when people aren't lovable, even when they're cross, even when they don't want to be loved, that it's the power of the risen Christ around us, that we put on, inside of us, that we breathe in, beside us, that we walk with, that gives us strength we don't have. First John 4, 4 says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He, he has a name, and the name is Jesus. He's here with us now. It's not just a story from 2,000 years ago. Jesus, he's your story and mine. Your story and mine. That we might know new life in praise and thanks. That we might know new life in, in faith. Where he is the one that saves us from that old creation. And Lord, who leads us into a new life, a new life, a new life of, of healing love, and that you and I just might be those locals that go into a world that needs, needs the healing and the wholeness that Jesus offers through us. This morning, it may be that you've been pursuing not Jesus, but love. And you've been pursuing a healing love, knowing that love is important. But 
but you didn't know that it's a healing love that ensues. It ensues, it follows that relationship with Jesus Christ. And this morning, your desire, your desire is to invite him. Invite, to, to put on the risen Christ, to breathe in the living Christ, to walk beside the living Christ as Savior and as Lord, that you might be a new creation. Well, I want to pray with you. Pray with me now. Jesus, this old story, it calls us forward. It, it, it calls us in to you, to a relationship where, Jesus, you might live your life in and through us today, this day. May this story, your story, become our story. As we invite you this day, Lord, that you might surround us. Surround us like the, the full armor of God. That you might live in us as the breath, as close as the very own breath that we breathe. That we might trust you and lean on you and rely on you as, as we rely on on breathing to live. Lord, this day, walk beside us to give us strength we don't have that we might follow and obey you as our Lord. Lord, and may what follows from it what follows from that, a, a healing love, not only for us, but for those in the place where you've put us, a healing love that makes, makes whole, a healing love that offers forgiveness, a healing love that, that bears a burden, a burden that we don't have strength to bear. Breathe your Holy Spirit on us this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, and what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our, when God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.